Trigger warning with this particular episode of Church of the Undead, we will be covering incest, and not everyone is comfortable listening to that. The Lord made only two people, Adam and Eve. Everyone else on earth sprang from that couple. But that leaves us with a somewhat disturbing conclusion. That means that when the Bible says their son Cain had a wife, he was married to his sister and then had children with her. But isn't that… uh… gross? Hello Weirdos, I'm Pastor Darren. Welcome to the Church of the Undead. Here in the Church of the Undead, I can share ideas which are relevant to those who suffer with depression, need some encouragement, and for those who love or are just curious about the God of the Bible. And it doesn't matter if you are a weirdo in Christ or just a weirdo, everybody's welcome here at the Church of the Undead. And I use the word undead because here we are dead to sin and alive in Christ. If you want to join this weirdo congregation, just click that subscribe or follow button and visit us online at WeirdDarkness.com slash church. Full disclosure, I might use the term pastor because I've branded this feature as a church, but I do not have a theology degree, nor did I ever go to Bible college. I'm just a guy who gave his life to Christ in 1989 and has tried to walk the walk ever since, and has stumbled a lot along the way. Because, like everybody else, I am an imperfect, heavily flawed human being. So please don't take what I say as gospel. Dig into God's Word yourself for confirmation, inspiration, and revelation. That being said, welcome to the Church of the Undead. The story of Adam and Eve's children, Cain and Abel, doesn't take up much room in the Bible. The story of their lives takes up one chapter, with a few genealogical details added in the next one. Despite this, the phrase Cain and Abel is known throughout our culture, and we all have a fairly good idea of what it means. Well, let's take a closer look at what the Bible actually says about these two men and their lesser-known siblings, which will eventually bring us to Cain and the mysterious question of who he married. According to Genesis 4, after being exiled from the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve had two sons, Cain and Abel. Cain was the first son. The Bible doesn't specify how much later that Abel was born. As adults, Cain and Abel took separate careers. Abel became a shepherd, while Cain became a farmer. Genesis 4:2. At some point, Cain and Abel both gave offerings to God from their produce. Cain gave crops from his harvest, while Abel gave sections of firstborn lambs. God accepted Abel's offering, but did not approve of what Cain brought. Cain was upset and jealous of Abel as a result, and God warned Cain to be careful. "'Why are you so angry?' the Lord asked Cain. "'Why do you look so dejected? You will be accepted if you do what is right. Then watch out. Sin is crouching at the door, eager to control you but you must subdue it and be its master." Genesis 4, verses 6 and 7. Later, the date's not clear, just one day, Cain asked Abel to walk with him in the field, and Cain killed Abel. God took a tactic similar to the one he used in Genesis 3, 9 after Cain's parents had eaten the forbidden fruit. He approached the wrongdoer and asked a question. In this case, he asked Cain, "'Where's your brother?' Cain responded, I don't know, am I my brother's keeper? Yeah, that's where we get the phrase, Genesis 4, verse 9. God rebuked Cain for his actions and told him that from this point he would be a homeless wanderer on the earth. Cain replied that he could not bear the punishment of forever wandering and that anyone who finds me will kill me. So God replied he would punish anyone who killed Cain seven times over and put a mark on Cain so that anyone who tried to kill Cain would be warned off. God approved of Abel's offerings, but not Cain's, and as a result, Cain resented his brother. Why precisely God didn't approve of Cain's offering is hard to say. It's worth noting that the Bible says Cain gave some of his crops without describing the quality of the offering, Genesis 4, verse 3. 
In contrast, the next verse says that Abel gave the best portions of the firstborn lambs from his flock. Abel gave the best, and he took it from the first results of his labors, not as an afterthought or after he was sure he had a surplus. We don't get any such details about Cain's crops, which may mean he didn't give the best. Cain may simply have not been showing proper respect toward God with his offering. Regardless of what Cain did wrong, the fact that God told Cain he would be accepted if he did what was right Genesis 4-7, indicates there was generally something wrong with Cain's offering. Not only was Cain jealous of God favoring Abel, but he also didn't appreciate the warning that God gave him. He was warned, and yet he continued to behave rebelliously. Even after he killed Abel, his rebellious attitude continued, as seen in his scoffing response, am I my brother's keeper? In essence, Cain's response was self-centered. The result was that he became a wanderer, a man with no community. He lived for himself and got only himself in return. Genesis 4 verses 25 and 26 picks up after the story of Cain's family, don't worry, we'll come back to that, and says that Adam and Eve had another son named Seth. After Seth was born, Eve said, God has granted me another son in place of Abel, whom Cain killed. Seth later had a son named Enosh, and genealogy in Genesis chapter 5 focuses on Seth's descendants, ending with Noah, who would become famous for building the ark. At first glance, Genesis 4 and 5 sounds like it's saying Adam and Eve didn't have any children between Abel and Seth. It says that after the birth of Seth, Adam lived another 800 years, and he had other sons and daughters, Genesis 5 verse 4, as if there was a long period where it was just Adam and Eve and their two sons, followed by a big expansion after Seth. However, this misses a couple of things. First, Cain said after God cursed him that he feared anyone who finds me will kill me. If there were no other children of Adam and Eve around at this point, who could Cain be talking about? Who would he have been afraid of? Some scholars have suggested the answer is that Adam and Eve were not the first and only human beings created, simply the ones Genesis focuses on because they're the ones who lived in the Garden of Eden. However, after Adam and Eve sinned in Genesis chapter 3, God said, look, the human beings have become like us, talking about them as representatives of their entire species. 1 Corinthians 15 continues this method by describing Adam as the first human. It says, For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. And that the first man was of the dust of the earth, the second man is of heaven. So it seems Adam and Eve were the first human beings. There weren't any other humans on the planet. Second, Genesis chapter 5 talks about Adam's lineage without mentioning Cain and Abel at all. It starts by saying, this is a written account of the descendants of Adam, and then says, when Adam was 130 years old, he became the father of a son who was just like him. He named his son Seth. This genealogy doesn't record every single descendant of Adam, only select ones. Therefore, Adam and Eve could have had more children between Abel and Seth, and likely did. We just don't know how many, whether Cain and Abel grew up with many brothers or sisters. This brings us to the title of our message, Did Cain Marry His Sister? After killing his brother, Cain had a son named Enoch, so we know he had to have sex with somebody. But who was on earth at that time to marry and start a family with? Assuming that Adam and Eve were the first man and woman, there were no pre-Adamic beings that humans mated with, it would seem that Cain and Seth must have married women descended from Adam and Eve. As established, we don't know when Adam and Eve started having daughters, or for that matter whether Abel had a wife and children unmentioned in the narrative. We also know that Adam was 130 years old when Seth was born, so there could have been several generations of people born in between Genesis 4.1 and Genesis 4.17, the first time that Cain's wife is mentioned. Therefore, we don't know whether Cain or Seth married their direct siblings, one of them might have done so and the other married a niece or a cousin, regardless, sheer math would indicate that at least one of Adam's three sons married a sister. 
After the world was formed, God finished his work of creation by raising one man from the dust and one woman from the man's ribs. Genesis 2 verses 21 and 22, So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man he made into a woman and brought her to the man. The Lord made only two people, so the only people available for Adam and Eve's sons to marry would have been their own sisters. Consequently, although this is not stated, the only logical conclusion is that Cain married his sister, or at least a close relative, and then they had children together. But that's, in, that's incest, right? I mean, that's wrong. Well, this idea is disturbing to us, and it goes against the laws forbidding incest in Leviticus 18. However, prior to this law being given in Leviticus, there are various instances of men marrying their sisters or other relatives. Abraham's wife Sarah was actually his half-sister by a different mother. Genesis 20, verses 11 through 13. Jacob married two of his female cousins, Genesis 29, 30. Moses' father married his aunt, Exodus 6, verse 20. For whatever reason, the law against incest doesn't seem to have been in effect, at least not as strictly, before God made the covenant with the Israelites in Mount Sinai in the book of Exodus. By modern legal definition, Cain would have had to commit incest with one of his sisters in order to create offspring because he had no other choice. If the entire human race came from an original pair, then this was unavoidable. By biblical standards, however, Cain was not breaking any laws because incest laws did not exist at the time. God formed woman from the rib of man so that a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. Genesis 2, verse 24. So, in other words, children and parents are not to have sexual relations with or marry each other, yet no actual laws about incest were given about brothers and sisters marrying in the unspoiled world of Eden before the fall or even before the Exodus. After the Exodus, God commanded, None of you shall approach any of his close relatives to uncover nakedness. Leviticus 18, verse 6. This is the law we are most familiar and comfortable with in our modern society. But Cain was not subject to that law, as he lived well before the law was ever given. Even so, God had never approved of indiscriminate sexual activity outside of the marriage relationship in any age of human history, including incest, because it strikes at the soundness of the family, and since the family is central to God's purposes and work on earth, his judgment on this practice is fierce. God also forbade incest to prevent genetic deformities, which are less common in the general population where intermarriage is not typical. Let's explore these two points. Biblical teacher Don Stewart explains the commandment against incest strengthened the structure of the family unit. One way to understand what he meant is to examine what happens to victims and witnesses of incest. In the case of consensual incest, there's a possibility that one or both parties are acting out the negative effects of previous sexual abuse suffered personally or witnessed as a child. These individuals are at an increased risk of re-victimization, often unconsciously, and for them, the line between involuntary and voluntary participation in sexual behavior is blurred. Whether sexual sin is involved or not, creating a strong and safe family unit becomes much harder in the wake of incest, and there is even a biblical example to demonstrate this. It happens in Genesis 19 with Lot's daughters. They grew up in Sodom and Gomorrah. Those names will probably sound familiar to you. Their cities associated with sexual immorality and unnatural lust. Sexual depravity was so openly displayed in these towns that it's reasonable to imagine Lot's daughters witnessed a lot of incest where they were growing up. Genesis 19 verse 13 says, God sent angels to destroy the cities because the outcry to the Lord against its people was so great. After Lot's family fled God's destruction, his wife was turned into a pillar of salt because she looked back on the burning cities as if her heart was still there, not moving forward, and Lot found a cave for his daughters and him to rest in. And here's where it gets gross for most of us. 
The daughters got their father drunk and had sex with him. Genesis 19, verses 33 through 35. Although, again, there was no written commandment against incest at this time, Jews still knew that sexual relation with one's parent was not part of God's plan for procreation. Going back to Genesis 2, verse 24, talking about how man and woman become one flesh. Sexual immorality in Lot's family probably, though, stemmed from Lot himself, not his daughters originally. They were modeled something horrible. Because earlier in this chapter, he offered up his daughters as potential victims of sexual abuse in place of the angels who were visiting his home. It is a powerful passage, so I'm going to read the whole thing to you. It's hard to believe this is something you actually read in the Bible. Genesis 19, verses 1 through 11. The two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and bowed himself with his face to the earth and said, My lords, please turn aside to your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you may rise up early and go on your way. They said, No, we will spend the night in the town square. But he pressed them strongly, so they turned aside to him and entered his house. And he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. But before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old, all the people to the last man, surrounded Lot's house, and they called to Lot, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us, that we may know them. In other words, have sex with them. Lot went out to the men at the entrance, shut the door after him, and said, I beg you, my brothers, do not act so wickedly. Behold, I have two daughters who have not known any man. Let me bring them out to you, and do to them as you please. Only do nothing to these men, for they have come under the shelter of my roof. But they said, Stand back. And they said, This fellow came to sojourn, and he has become the judge. Now we will deal worse with you than with them. Then they pressed hard against the man Lot, and drew near to break the door down. But the men reached out their hands, and brought Lot into the house with them, and shut the door. And they struck with blindness the men who were at the entrance of the house, both small and great, so that they wore themselves out, groping for the door. What must have Lot's daughters thought of their own value after this? Who would blame them for feeling their bodies were the only thing of importance after their own father almost had them given over to a sex-crazed mob to do with as they please? Their value, identity, and unity with any possible future spouse would be forever tainted if not completely destroyed. These girls emerged from a culture of depravity in Sodom and Gomorrah. And then, their dad here tries to give them up to a mob in order to be raped. So, this is what influenced their behavior later on in the cave. The girls were witnesses, and then potential victims, and finally, they were perpetrators of incest, which led to the births of two sons whose futures were embodied by the destruction in these sexual crimes. The sons born of incest by these sisters would eventually start two separate tribes related to but frequently in conflict with Israel, the Moabites and Ammonites. The original intention of family was to reflect God's character, but more than that, it provides a safe place where children can experience God's love through their parents and learn how to love other people properly. No family is perfect, of course, but incest destroys and distorts God's purpose for families. The biblical example of Lot and his daughters demonstrates the potential for long-term consequences. Of course, the other reason incest is not allowed is because of the mutations in genetics, and God knew that when he created the law against incest. The more insular a community is, the more prevalent certain diseases will be. Scientists report that many unique genetic disorders result when communities begin or persist with small founding populations and cultural isolation. The perfect and most heartbreaking example of this is King Charles or Carlos II of Spain. He was the last Habsburg ruler of Spain, and thankfully so. He was tragically ugly, but it wasn't his fault. It was the desire of his family to maintain their bloodline. Charles II of Spain was born November 6, 1661, 
and he became king in 1665 at the tender young age of four years old. His mother ruled as a regent for ten years until Charles was a teenager. Charles was born into political strife in Europe as the Habsburgs tried to control the entire continent. You see, the Habsburgs came from Austria, and they had designs on the French throne. The Habsburgs ruled the Netherlands, Belgium, and parts of Germany, but unfortunately Charles II was too ugly, too deformed, and too intellectually stunted to rule Spain and its neighbors properly. You see, that's what happens after 16 generations of inbreeding. The Habsburgs were so bent on keeping power, as they had for a few hundred years, that they often married their own blood relatives. After 16 generations of this, Charles II's family was so inbred that his grandmother and his aunt were the same person. It gets worse. Charles II's most prominent feature was his jaw, known as the Hasburg jaw, that identified him as part of his royal family. His two rows of teeth could not meet. The king was unable to chew his food. Charles II's tongue was so huge he could barely speak. He was not able to walk until he was almost fully grown, and his family didn't bother to educate him. The king was illiterate and totally dependent on those around him. His first wife, Marie Louise of Orleans, Charles II's second niece, came from an arranged marriage. The French ambassador wrote to the Spanish court in 1679 that Marie wanted absolutely nothing to do with Charles, saying that the Catholic king is so ugly as to cause fear and he looks ill. And the ambassador was 100% correct. Charles II of Spain could barely walk because his legs could not support his weight. He fell several times. Marie died in 1689 without producing an heir for Charles II. The Spanish monarch was depressed about this after his wife died. Depression, of course, was a common trait among the Habsburgs. Why wouldn't it be with so much inbreeding? But also in the Habsburgs was gout, dropsy, and epilepsy. The lower jaw was the kicker, though. It made Charles II seem stunted. His ministers and advisors suggested the next move in Charles II of Spain's reign was to marry a second wife. The second marriage was to Marie Anne of Newburg and it happened mere weeks after his first wife died. Marie Anne's parents had 23 children, so surely Charles II would have at least one child with her, right? Wrong. Charles II in Spain was impotent and could not father children. It was part of his family legacy of inbreeding, and it's probably a good thing he was impotent. Imagine how tortured his offspring would be. He probably suffered from two genetic disorders, First, there was a combined pituitary hormone deficiency, a disorder that made him short, impotent, infertile, weak, and have a host of digestive problems. The other disorder was distal renal tubular acidosis, a condition marked by blood in the urine, weak muscles, and having an abnormally large head compared to the rest of the body. Charles II's ugliness and health problems were not due to anything he did. Generations of his family's inbreeding were to blame. The irony of the situation is that the Habsburgs felt as if their line would only survive if they married only people who were of royal blood. And this very same thought led to at least two centuries of inbreeding that finally failed to produce an heir to the throne. Charles II of Spain died, mercifully, in 1700 at the age of 39. Because he had no children, his death caused a 12-year war in Europe known as the War of Spanish Succession. Habsburg's reign was finally over. While genetic mutation is not specifically mentioned in Mosaic law in the Bible, it only references to being unclean or defiled, Leviticus 18.24, God did not permit intermarriage among his chosen people in order to lessen the likelihood of genetic issues. Once sin came into the world through Adam and Eve, the world began to slowly become more and more corrupted, and that included our DNA. When all of our DNA was perfect, without genetic mutations, incest would not have been an issue when it came to having healthy offspring. But our DNA began to be corrupted, and DNA in families is, of course, passed to the next generation, as we just saw. If Cain and his sister had children together, they would have passed on genetic mutations as well, leading to birth defects and a host of diseases. Such a conclusion, however, overlooks the fact that 
When God created the world, it was very good in His words. Without sin, there was no suffering, there was no pain. It was not until Adam and Eve freely chose to rebel against God that pain and suffering entered into the world. Part of that pain and suffering includes disease and deformity, genetic mutation. As bad as it was in the 1600s with Prince Charles II there, interfamily procreation is even more likely to cause genetic deformities today. The further time goes, the worse it gets. In the beginning, though, there would not have been the usual genetic defects arising from intermarriage because Adam and Eve were created perfect with a perfect gene pool. Only later would families see the genetic results of intermarriage and interfamily procreation. God has made a convincing case here against incest and demonstrated that incest is both a cause of and a result of disobedience and pain. God Almighty always has a plan, however. He redeemed the sin committed by Lot's daughters, Ruth as a Moabite, traced her genealogy back to Lot and his daughters in the cave in Genesis 19. Jesus traced his lineage back to Ruth through the line of his adopted father Joseph. God weaves his grace through the genealogies, and he loves to produce something beautiful out of sordid family backgrounds. Although God's Word offers wisdom and direction in the matter of marriage and sexual behavior in order to protect his children, many people are living with genetic illness, the sin of having committed incest, or the shame of being victimized. But the good news is that the bodies of believers will be made perfect in heaven forevermore. But until then, even now, Jesus offers freedom. He can redeem confessed sin, bring peace and hope to a life thrown into chaos by illness, and help victims of sexual crime forgive those responsible and experience emotional freedom. If you like what you heard, share this episode with others who you think might also like it. Maybe the person you share it with will want to join this weirdo congregation too. To join this weirdo family yourself, find us on Facebook, listen to previous messages, even find out how to join me in my daily Bible studies, visit WeirdDarkness.com slash church. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash church. You can find the sources I used for this week's message in the show notes. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me, weirdos, and until next time, Jesus loves you, and so do I. God bless.